I'd like to call our meeting to order. Good morning. This is New Lenox Toastmasters, March 26, 2011. Welcome. It's good to have you here. This is a good day for speech makers, for leaders in the making, and evidently for lumberjacks right outside of our window. So that'll create a very good dynamic for our meeting this morning. Welcome. I'd like you to rise now and say with me the pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. And I'd like to welcome our current club president, Nancy Dye, who is serving as our Toastmaster. The Toastmaster serves as the facilitator for our whole club meeting. Welcome, Nancy. Good morning, and as Wayne said, welcome to the New Lenox Toastmasters, which meets at the United Methodist Church on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month from 8.30 to 10. And we're very timely, so if you have another commitment on Saturday, please don't worry. The Methodist Church is located at 339 West Haven Avenue for our viewing audience. And if you don't know where 339 West Haven is, every summer we have the Campground Festival on the grounds, which most of the community is aware of. So we'd love to have you here. So before we start the meeting, I wanted to demystify what Toastmasters is all about. Because people either know what it is or they don't. Very briefly, Toastmasters is a workshop in which participants sharpen their speaking and their leadership skills in a friendly atmosphere. Since 1924, four million people have been Toastmasters members. And 24 of the four million, which is actually down to 260,000 current members, are in the New Lenox Club. This club started in April of 2009 as a faith-based initiative from the United Men's Ministry in New Lenox. And because we are faith-based, We've had people from several other communities join us for that reason. If you are looking to improve your leadership or your speaking skills, ignite your career, or win that job interview, we would welcome you to Toastmasters. It is one of the most positive reinforcement environments you'll ever find. And one of my brief favorite stories is about a Toastmasters member we had last year, David Smith, Jr the son of village board trustee David Smith and school board member Sue Smith, was a member, and he was applying to go to the US Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, David got accepted into the Naval Academy for several re reasons, but he wanted us to know that one of the panelists in Annapolis was impressed that he was in Toastmasters, because that panelist had also been a Toastmaster. So you never know when Toastmasters will help you out. Every meeting we have a theme, and primarily for the viewing audience, today's theme is how Toastmasters impacted my life. And you'll hear that theme throughout the different parts of the meeting. As a faith-based group, we start every meeting with an invocation, and I would like to invite John Chop up to present that for us. rise and bow our heads. Oh, my Father, I pray that you bless this meeting. I pray that you keep us all safe from the evil of, the, of, of Satan and look over us and protect us. It is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The next speaker on our agenda is Patrick Dalseth, and Patrick is going to present with us the word of the day 
which one of our evaluation team is going to be keeping track of. Patrick? Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. The word of the day is used in our group where we present a word that's not normally uh, heard of, a definition is given, and then the members speaking at that particular meeting try to incorporate the word into their speeches. I have chosen the word kismet. Since our theme is how has Toastmasters affected your life, the definition of kismet is destiny or fate. To use it properly, a quote would be, it's pure kismet when these two find each other. Since I've joined Toastmasters, the last 18 to 24 months, we have, I have heard several stories of how Toastmasters has affected people. As Nancy stated, um, there was uh, um, Dave Smith Jr. Uh, he got into the Naval Academy and uh, on his interview panel there was the the gentleman that was also a Toastmasters. And there are several stories of how they've helped with job interviews. And I know that there's been a, a specific one member here that did get a job due to um, the confidence that he gained from, from Toastmasters. Now what I'm about to do, I have not asked permission for, but since this is a special meeting, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> One of the great things about Toastmasters is that when you're behind the lectern, it's your lectern, and you can do whatever you want for the allotted time. <laughs> I'm going to introduce a second word, and the only reason why I'm doing that is because yesterday I learned that the Oxford English Dictionary has recently added words to their dictionary. Believe it or not, those words are OMG, which is nomenclature in the texting world for oh my god. Um, and uh, I can't think of some of the other ones. Um, oh, the heart sign, the, the arrow with the three, like I heart New York. So the other word that was very interesting is the word muffin top. <laughs> I was reading the article in the Chicago Tribune talking about these words and the reference that they came up with, well, there were two references. One was to the episode of Seinfeld where it got its popularity, Muffin Top, where Elaine wanted to take the tops of the muffins and just sell the tops of the muffins. The other definition that was given was, and I quote, a protuberance of flesh above the waistband of a tight pair of jeans, known as the Muffin Top. I challenge the group today to use the real word, kismet, and I'll give you extra double bonus points if you can incorporate Muffin Top into your speech today. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you. We'll all be hoping that our Muffin Top, if we have one, is not recognized today. Next person on our agenda is going to bring us a little bit of levity, and that is J.R. Robles, our club treasurer, and he's going to act as the humorist. Toastmaster. I got word for Patrick. I'm going to tell two stories. One is about Kismet, the other one is about Muffin Top. All right, the first one, a young son, 10-year-old, and his father were out on a fishing trip, and the son insisted, they were out on a Sunday, insisted that they would go to church at a rural, rural church, and so the father was very proud and said, okay, let's go. So they went to the church, and uh, the collection plate was coming around. All of a sudden, the father reached into his pockets, and he couldn't find any of the money. He says, uh oh I forgot, but he did find a dime, so he gave it to his son to put on the collection plate, right? So after the service, they were walking out to the car, and the father was kind of complaining, this was a long service, and the sermon was boring, and the chorus, the singing was off key. The son finally said, Daddy, I thought it was great for a dime. <laughs> All right, so. Right. The second story, the muffin top story, I had a friend, uh, Father George, several years back. Uh, he was opening his mail one morning. He 
there was an envelope with one page and one word, the word full, F-O-O-L. So that following Sunday, as the congregation is gathered and uh, parishioners are there, he addresses them and he says, I have received many letters for many of you, the past, and you have forgotten to sign the letter. This week I received a letter and the person remembered to sign it, but he didn't, he, for, he forgot to write the letter. That's the muffin top guy. So. <laughs> and Toastmaster? So. Before our speeches start, I am going to introduce you to the second in command at this meeting, who is our general evaluator, Frank Hemmler. Frank? Thank you. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests, I am the general evaluator of this meeting, and as you probably, some of you know, we rotate the duties every two weeks. So. Somebody else will be the general evaluator and another Toastmaster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my whole uh, gamut covers from the opening devotion to the closing benediction. But I have some very talented assistants. Specifically, each speech, each talk, which is assigned, and there's two of them assigned today, has a particular evaluator. And I'm going to ask those evaluators in just a minute to stand and tell me the name of the person they are evaluating, the subject of the speech, the length of time, and what this talker, speaker, wishes to evaluate. And I'm going to start off with Wayne DeBoer. And you can stay there or come up here. Either one, Wayne. Thank you, Frank. I will be evaluating Greg Rodriguez and his 10th speech today. That's a very commendable achievement, obviously, but he has a very big goal. He has to incorporate all of the previous nine skill sets in the Competent Communication Manual. So go Greg's goal today will be to inspire us, his audience, by presenting a proposal for a change of action and winning us over to actually make change. That's Greg's goal, and that's what I'll be evaluating. Thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Evaluator of speech number two is John Chott. John, would you come up and tell us whom you were evaluating, the length of the speech, and what the desired goals are? John? Uh, yeah, I'll be evaluating Beth Gordon. Uh, length of her speech is five to seven minutes. Her topic is, do you know what it is? And she's going to try to be, it's an informative edu slash educational speech. And she's going to try to do that as well as having an opening and closing connect. Thank you, John. Yeah. You've heard it uh, spoken of a couple of times here that the length of the speech is a certain number of times. We have times allotted to each particular thing, and I'm going to ask Mike Timmons, our timekeeper, to tell us what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. Mr. General Evaluator, fellow Toastmasters, and all of my adoring fans, both of you. It would be my wife, Rosa, and my golden retriever, Charlie. As timer today, I will be timing everything because the Toastmasters credo is stand up, speak up, and the unspoken words are sit down and give somebody else a chance. So I'll be timing everything. I mentioned the time for the speeches, but also in table topics, it's a one to two minute event. So at one minute, you'll get the green flag, at a minute and a half, the yellow, and at two minutes, the red, which means wrap it up and sit down. The evaluators will each be given two to three minutes, which means that at two minutes, you'll get the red flag, or I'm sorry, the green flag. At two and a half, you get the yellow card. And at three minutes, you get the red, which means wrap it up. 
Mr. General Guywitter. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And the last person I'd like to have uh, give this a uh, little bit is Charles Keskel. He's the Topics Master, and I'd like to have him explain just a little bit about what is it, Topics Master. Between the evaluations and the speakers, there is an opportunity called Table Topics, which allows us to provide impromptu speeches of one to two minutes in duration. The participants select a word today or whatever the Table Topics master decides to uh, have as a theme for the different speakers, and they speak about that. Because of today's meeting being on Toastmasters in our life, we are going to have words that relate to Toastmaster skills that you can use in everyday life. Thank you. Last but not least, in order to keep this thing under control, you have to have a cop. So we have a grammar police. Maureen, would you come up and tell us what is it, a grammar police? Good morning. My duty today is to practice my listening skills, and I will be listening for ahs, ums, so's, uh, repetitive words that the person is not conscious that they're even saying. So sometimes they would be repeating the word so, and then I would be counting that in a very loving, caring way. <laughs> and just let them know. If the number could be a little too high, I don't have to say it out loud. I can just hand them a slip of paper. And I also look for extraordinary words or unusual words, maybe muffin top and kismet, if people are using those just to keep track because it's fun to know and it's a challenge to use a new word. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, we've got a pretty good team ready to go, and we are ready to go. So our speaker number one is Greg Rodriguez, who is also an officer of the club, a vice president of public relations. Greg, as Wayne alluded to earlier, is reaching a milestone today. When you join Toastmasters, you get a book of 10 different speeches that start you on your confidence journey as a public speaker. And those different speeches have criteria, such as the first speech is introducing yourself or, or presenting an icebreaker, as we call it. Some, another speech is on vocal variety. Another speech is on how well you use visual aids. But, when, but Greg is going to help us, inspire us, on the topic that he has chosen. And that topic is the State of the Union. Now, besides Greg giving his 10th speech, which he will now have the award and accreditation of being a competent communicator, Greg is also going to be a contestant in our international speech contest. And he has stepped up to do that. We're so glad to have a representative because we are having the area contest in New Lenox April 16th, and Greg will be our designee. Now, I had to organize the speech contest, which involved making announcements to the group, sending out emails to make sure people knew that they could compete, and I'm so grateful that Greg has stepped up. One thing that's important to note is that while your agendas say that Greg's speech is to be eight to 10 minutes, for the contest, it has to be no less than four minutes and 30 seconds and no more than seven minutes and 30 seconds. And as Maureen and um, Mike mentioned, the timing and the grammarian is so important, particularly for a contestant, because when they get to the next level, they're going to be scrutinized more than they are today. And I know I'm not making Greg nervous because he's so good at this, even though I'm giving all these additional steps involved. Please welcome Greg to his speech number 10, the State of the Union. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, guests. 
For the past 222 years, the sitting president, as mandated in Article 2, Section 3 of the United States Constitution, is required to address the Congress in regards to the State of the Union. In times past, that has come to include the American people in that address as well. Now, clearly, I'm not the president. Yet the message I have today has a significant impact upon the state of our union. I believe that we're at a critical time in our nation's history, a time of national peril, but national opportunity. This fact has not gone unrecognized by previous administrations. I need to make one thing clear that when I refer to the term union, what I'm referring to is that of the family. And when I use the term state, I'm talking about the state of fatherhood, fathering. So tip, basically my, my speech is on fathering of the family. Now this has not gone unrecognized in previous administrations. The Clinton administration in 1995 mandated the National Fatherhood Initiative, which was designated to help men in their roles as fathers. At that time, there were 14 million families without a father physically present in a home. Today, that figure is at over 22 million. In 2009, there was a poll taken, and 72% of the respondents felt that this issue was the most significant social problem that we as a country face. The results, we read it in our headlines, we see it in the news, we hear it from our children from, at school. I have a 10 and a 12 year old and the stories they come, that they tell me about the, the children and, and the things that go on, it's, it's disconcerting. Alcohol and drug use, criminal behavior, violence, children experimenting with sex at at such young ages, it's troubling. It's at epidemic levels, and something needs to be done. Casualties are children. Virtually every social pathology that we're experiencing can be linked to one root cause, and that root cause is fatherlessness. Now, when we hear the term fatherlessness, I think what comes to mind is a father not physically present in the, in the home. But yet, as a therapist, I work with, most of my work is done with families and couples. And most of the families have a father in the home. So there's more than one way to define fatherlessness because they're having the same problems that I just mentioned. Fatherless, for me, what I see in the counseling arena is these men have a lack of an understanding of what it means to be a father and what their role is, as well as the needs of their children. So they get kind of missing in action. They're kind of missing the mark, I call it. Men, I'm here to tell you that unless you have a vision for your fatherhood, unless you have a vision for your family and your children's lives, it's not enough. Unless you have a plan to accomplish that, not enough, and I say not enough because the statistics show that 90% of teenagers, by the time they're through at high school, will have experimented with alcohol and drugs. 90% of the families who, who practice a faith, 90% of those teens will leave their faith. 70% of the teens, by the time they reach age 19, will have had sexual intercourse. Now I hear it, well, that's what kids do. That's life, that's society we live in. Or, not mine, not my kids. That's not gonna happen. And the fact is it does, 90%. Now, when I deal with men, I get, I'm tough. I'm tough on dads, I'll, I'll give you that. But the fact is, what, what comes to my mind is Abraham Lincoln's words long ago, he said, he has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. And that's why I'm here speaking about what I'm speaking today, because this needs to be spoken about. And the life work, the work that I do day in and day out working with families, well, I've made it, I've dedicated my life to assisting fathers 
with the tools, giving them the tools, equipping them with the information they need to be better fathers, to be more equipped, to get their kids not to fall into these, these traps. But I'm just one man. The fact is, I need all of you. What I'm proposing is a grassroots movement because I don't feel real change is going to occur until every man steps up and takes a more active and responsible role in their kids' lives. And I emphasize responsibly because there's a lot of guys that are active in their, in their families' lives, but it's not enough. They don't have a plan. So responsible, but that's a whole nother discussion. But we need, I need every one of us to, to, to hold our men, our fathers, accountable. We need to encourage them and support them but I don't get that sense in society today. I mean, with the TV shows, it always seems that the, they're putting down the father. The fact is, is we need to change that paradigm. Because as men, we can't do it alone. Even though we try, we can't do it alone. We need our society to raise up fathers. Now, what I'm proposing as a first step is a pledge, a fathering pledge. It's asking men to take that step. To, t to make that commitment. Now you're thinking, well, this is just a couple lines. What's that gonna do? How's that gonna make a difference? The fact is there was a time in our country and in our lives when a man's word meant something, that they were as good as their word, it was a handshake. And the fact is when men do write their, when they sign off and they do make a commitment, it makes a difference. I've seen it, I've seen it benefit their families. And then it benefits the, the schools it can benefit our community and hopefully eventually the world. John Paul II, the late Pope, had made a comment. It was quoted as saying that as the family goes, so goes the nation and so goes the world. It's a daunting task, but it's possible. I know men, I know what you feel like. You feel like, well, I'm just one person. And to the world, we are just one person. But to one person, we may be the world. And that's what I'm telling you, dads, is to our children, we are that person. So what I'm saying is to go make a difference. I have pledge seats in the back. Feel free to, to pick up a pledge seat, and as many as you wish, or make copies, to give it to the fathers in your life and ask them to please step up, because our country's destiny is kismet if we don't make a change. It has been my task to report to you the state of the nation. To improve it is the task for us all. God bless us, our families. Madam President. Very nicely done and a very timely topic. And before we move on to the next speaker, as a club, we need to give Greg as much feedback as we possibly can before he goes to the next level contest. And on your tables are perforated evaluation forms, so please feel free to give him any feedback that you're comfortable giving. Our next speaker is Beth Gordon. Beth is giving her third speech, which, is in, which the subject is to get us to the point. And the title of her speech is GF. Do you know what it is? It's lurking everywhere, in your foods, cosmetics, and even your shampoos and lotions. If you're sensitive to this ingredient, but you don't even know it yet, you may be sacrificing your health for today and tomorrow. Free yourself from disease by excluding the culprit of many diseases. Beth Gordon presenting GF, Do You Know What It Is?